Uh, both John and I are platform engineers at Square on the data, online data storage team, where we support both MySQL and Postgres. Uh, between the two of us, we've administered Oracle, MySQL, Fox Pro, uh, Postgres, DB2, Microsoft SQL Server, and a slew of other uh, database management systems that are, have been long since forgotten. And we've been doing it for an embarrassing number of years. So we've gone through this sort of process of having to learn a new relational database management system a number of times. Uh, before we begin, a quick poll. Uh, who, here, who here is an expert in MySQL? Expert in Postgres? Oh, this talk is not for you. Yeah, no, this is for people transitioning from MySQL to Postgres. Um, and, and from my experience, this is, these are actually two of the most difficult uh, databases to come from and to. Uh, it's really fairly simple to transition from an Oracle to a Postgres and back and forth, but MySQL to Postgres or any other database management system is, is generally difficult. We have about uh, 55 minutes today, so we'll try and keep the presentation about 40 to 45 minutes so that we have 10 to 15 minutes uh, at the end for questions. Uh, but do feel free to interrupt if you've got any questions or if I start to ramble during the presentation. We'll start off by covering some, port some important differences in uh, terminology, functionality, administration, uh, installation, replication, and go from there. And we'll try mostly to just be sort of objectively uh, observing differences. Uh, we won't go into which database system is better because we all know Oracle is the best. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of quick terminology differences that I think are really critical uh, coming from the MySQL world. I uh, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. In Postgres, uh, schema is a named collection of tables. Uh, schema can contain, can contain views, indexes, sequences, data types, uh, operators, functions, things like that. And schemas are analogous to uh, directories at the operating system level, except that uh, schemas can't be nested. It's technically the same thing in MySQL. Uh, in fact, the MySQL glossary specifically refers to uh, operating system directories in the entry, but you almost never hear a MySQL DBA refer to a schema. Uh, instead, they use the term database, and that's really unfortunate because almost all other relational database management systems, uh, the term schema is widely used and understood in the same way. So next is database. A database means a very specific thing to just about everybody except for people that uh, run MySQL. In Postgres, a database is a named collection of SQL objects or database objects. And generally, every database object, whether they're tables or functions, uh, belong to one and only one database. But there are obviously a few system catalogs that are available cluster-wide. Um, more accurately, a database is a collection of schemas and the, the schemas contain the tables and functions, et cetera. So the full hierarchy uh, is server, database, schema, table. As it turns out, MySQL has no distinct concept for this. Rather, both schema and database are, are rolled up into the same concept, sort of. Uh, to recap, and this is really important, uh, <clears throat> in Postgres, server, database, contains schemata, contains tables. Uh, MySQL, on the other hand, uh, the users say, my database contains databases which contain tables, uh, right? And that's colloquial, and it's actually uh, really bad because it makes no sense to people that actually use other database management systems. So uh, how MySQL folks should refer to things are, are your server uh, contains your schema, contain your tables. Storage engines. One of the major differences you'll notice when you're new to Postgres is the lack of storage engine support. Uh, Postgres is a unified database server with a single storage engine, while MySQL has two layers, effectively a server layer or a SQL layer, uh, and then a storage engine layer. And uh, MySQL 5.6 and 5.7 each natively support uh, nine storage engines, and each of those have very distinct capabilities. If you're new to Postgres, you might think that this is a uh, lack of storage engine support is problematic, but the end result is that actually that Postgres has long been ahead of MySQL in terms of index types and optimizer features. And I speculate that this is at least in part due to the fact that with MySQL's pluggable storage engine architecture, sacrifices have, be, have to be made when you're introducing a new feature, right? You have to decide is this going to be in the SQL layer, or is this going to be in the storage engine layer? And I think the best example of this is when index condition pushdown got introduced in my, MySQL 5.6. Uh, for those that you, of you who don't know, uh, ICP is basically an optimization for the case where MySQL retrieves rows from a table using an index. Without ICP, uh, MySQL will ask the base table, the base, or excuse me, MySQL will ask, ask the storage engine. The storage engine will traverse the index on the base table, hand it back up to the server, and the, where the 
actual wear will be evaluated. With index condition pushed down, as long as certain criteria are met, uh, the wear clause will go down to the storage engine, uh, and the storage engine will uh, you know, do the, the evaluation of the wear clause there. And that results in fewer accesses to the base table, uh, as well as fewer trips between the uh, storage engine layer and the server layer. And this can actually be uh, really amazing. All of the MySQL DBAs that, that I know were really excited when this came out. Uh, and Postgres doesn't actually have this feature or a feature like it because it doesn't need it, right? Everything in Postgres understands the capabilities of the storage engine in advance. So like crazy features like this uh, and workarounds aren't really needed. Uh, another often ignored consideration of storage engines are the effect that they have on replication. Postgres has the concept of a transaction log uh, for the storage engine. It serves a dual purpose. First, it's the storage engine transaction log. Second, it is the source of truth for replication. In MySQL, because the replication subsystem is separate from the storage engine subsystem, uh, the replication has no knowledge of an actual transaction log. Indeed, there are uh, storage engines in MySQL that, that don't support transactions, so don't have a transaction log. So a lot of work has gone in over the years to try and sort of shore up uh, these differences between a transaction log and a replication binary log. Uh, so I think that that's uh, an important consideration. So moving on to installation, uh, let's, MySQL and Postgres both have a lot of commonality when, when you're installing them, uh, though it's both worth going over, there are a couple of differences. The two most popular ways to install the MySQL binary are the distribution package and the binary tarball. Uh, installing Postgres is going to feel very familiar if you use regular package management systems like RPM or dpackage. Uh, Postgres offers native repos, and, and that's probably the simplest way to manage your installations. But if you are used to using a binary tarball, uh, you can just download the Postgres source, compile it, and ship it out there. The basic outline of installing Postgres is extraordinarily well documented online. Uh, you set up the repo, and Postgres, again, provides official support for both Debian and Red Hat distributions. Uh, you install the basic packages, and much like MySQL, uh, Postgres is broken up into multiple packages. You've got the client, you've got the server, libs, dev, uh, debug, things like that. Uh, and then you init DB, uh, and that is the equivalent of running MySQL install DB. It'll normally be run from the service script or PG control. Uh, and then finally, go ahead and start your database. And this sets you up for a local connections and initial configuration. It's worth, it's worth touching on the way that you log in to Postgres versus MySQL. The default, the default authentication allowed is for the super user on the local box. So this user is authenticated at the TCP connection using IDENT, which uh, to simplify means that a corresponding Linux user must exist. So at this point, uh, you know, after you've installed the RPMs, you'll notice uh, in your uh, Etsy password file that there is a Postgres system user. Uh, so you can log in uh, using something like sudo-u Postgres PSQL, and that brings you to the Postgres prompt. And much like the MySQL prompt, it supports read line for editing, prompt customization, variables, and a host of other features. The default Postgres prompt displayed here is going to display the database you're currently connected to, and in this case, that's Postgres. Uh, the hashtag symbol is a standard privilege identifier. So in this case, it means we're logged in as a super user. If you're uh, logged in as not a super user, it will show you a greater than symbol. And the equal sign is actually really important here, and it, will de it deserves a little bit more discussion. It identifies any nesting that you're currently in. And here's an example. If you're going to create a table, for example, create table dogs, uh, open parentheses, and then carriage return, uh, you'll see that the equal sign has been replaced with a, uh, an open parentheses, and that's simply to remind you that you need to uh, uh, close the parentheses. And the same uh, works when you're doing quotes. It'll show you that you're in a quote. Uh, the same thing if you have a multi-line query, but you aren't in a quote, the equal sign will be replaced with a dash. Right? So it's, it's pretty helpful when you're just writing ad hoc queries. Uh, another thing about the Postgres command line client that I think people coming from MySQL will love is that it has tab completion, uh, and it does it really well. Uh, so that's actually a huge win for people that you know, have a lot of database objects that they you know, tab through. Uh, after you've got a, an up and running uh, Postgres instance, the first thing you generally do is create a database. Again, remember in Postgres, database, schema, tables. Uh, and then you can use backslash C to use the database, and then you can create a schema. And then uh, you can create a user and then grant uh, that user uh, privileges on any particular schema. That's the general workflow. So 
now we've got a fully functioning Postgres database. Uh, let's talk about configuration files. The, in MySQL, you've got etsy.my.conf or etsy.mysqlmy.conf if you're running a Debian-based distribution. And in Postgres, you've really got two files that you immediately care about. That's postgresql.conf and pghba.conf. And both of those live in the Postgres data directory. Uh, like my.conf, the postgresql.conf file uh, accepts key value syntax. It's used to configure things uh, like logging, um, you know, basically everything, memory, memory allocation. Uh, and one thing that you'll notice uh, in MySQL to get even a decently in, a decent installation, you, there's a lot of things that you have to configure, right? Especially using the InnoDB storage engine. Whereas with Postgres, like most most folks, like if they don't know the workload that they're going to have, you can just basically say, oh, this is my hardware. I'm going to tune the effective cache size, shared buffers, and, and work mem, and, and twiddle little bits later on, depending on the workload. Uh, but with MySQL, there's a whole lot of things that you have to do. Uh, pghba.conf, again, lives in the data directory by default. It's used to control network authentication and authorization, and I'm going to talk about this uh, in a little bit because it's, it's bitten me so many times. Uh, the system is, is far more flexible than MySQL's simple mask-based authentication, uh, and that, that flexibility sort of comes at operational complexity and overhead. And after we've made changes to pghba.conf, we'll need the changes to take effect, so we'll use uh, pgcontrolreload, which effectively sends a sig hub and says reread all of your configuration files. Uh, this is... Uh, a, a hitless configuration reload, so you can do it all day long and it won't matter. Which brings us to the access privilege systems. Uh, they're very different in, in MySQL and Postgres. Most of us should be very familiar uh, with the MySQL system. It hasn't changed a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, Grant and Revoke are the only first-class citizens when managing user accounts. All of the records are stored in the MySQL database, and while you can update the data directly using DML, uh, that's generally discouraged. Since 5.5 came out in 2010, MySQL has supported pluggable authentication, uh, so you can use PAM, Windows logins, LDAP, Kerberos, uh, in addition to the usual, usual MySQL authentication. Uh, additionally, the protocols used to connect to MySQL are generally limited to TCP IP, Unix sockets, or named pipes on Windows, and you typically specify which protocols a user can log in with when the user is created. Uh, Postgres is an entirely different beast. Odds are that it's going to trip you up uh, at least once while you familiarize, with, uh, familiarize yourself with Postgres. And this is especially true uh, when trying to drop database objects uh, who have complicated uh, users and grants and owners. The Postgres developers chose to go with a role-based access control model uh, whose main elements are roles and groups. And actually, those are now synonymous uh, in modern versions of Postgres. Notice that we don't create users, we create roles. So by definition, a role is an entity that can own database objects and have database privileges. Uh, a role can actually be considered a user, for simplicity, or it can be considered a group, or it can be considered both, depending on uh, how it's used. So things can get real hairy real fast uh, if you don't manage your, your uh, users, groups, and roles well. Uh, it's important to note that the roles are defined at the database cluster level, so are valid on all databases within the cluster. Uh, role metadata, you can check out um, the PG role view. And if you're completely new to Postgres, again, group is synonymous with user. Uh, generally, the documentation has been shored up since those two concepts were merged in 8.1. Um, but you know, if you do a Google, Google search, you'll still find you know, people blogging and, and talking about um, you know, roles versus groups. So to manage roles, uh, create, alter, grant, and revoke. They're pretty self-explanatory, but again, much more powerful than their MySQL counterparts. And you'll use you know, backslash du, uh, pg user, pg shadow, et cetera, et cetera, when, when managing user accounts. Uh, and, and finally, pghba.conf, again, because this will bring you pain. Um, <clears throat> it's the host-based authentication vial again. So for those of you with an Oracle background, you can think of this as your tnsnames.ora. Uh, it controls all, all client authentication. And the general format uh, we've got here, it's a set of records, one per line. Uh, it's made up of a number of fields separated by spaces or tabs uh, and can only ever be a single line. Very important, one line. <laughs> Uh, so the specific format, uh, the first column is how the uh, client is allowed to connect. Host means uh, Unix sockets, host, excuse me, local corresponds to Unix sockets, host is TCP IP, host SSL and host no SSL basically explicitly say uh, whether or not SSL is required. Uh, the second column is uh, which database the record matches, and you can use all to match all databases, but that's generally frowned upon. Uh, there are special cases here like replication, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, column three specifies the user. 
Uh, so again, the value all specifies all users. Again, generally a bad idea. Uh, otherwise, uh, this is a specific user uh, unless it's preceded by a plus sign. Uh, if it's preceded by a plus sign, it will match any of the roles that are directly or indirectly members of this role. Right? So that can surprise a lot of people. Uh, multiple usernames can uh, be separated by you know, comma-separated values, or if you want to load a file with a bunch of usernames, you can use the at symbol. So again, things get really hairy here real quick. It's important to note like, one distinction in MySQL. Uh, if you've got two users, you know, Ryan at 10.% and then Ryan at percent, if the user Ryan logs in from anywhere in the 10 space, it will use the grants for Ryan at 10.% because that is the most specific grant that can be used. Doesn't matter when users were created or you know, whether they're alphabetized. Whereas in Postgres, it will use the first matching entry in pghba.conf, and that can surprise a lot of people, uh, regardless of the specificity of the grant. Uh, so if you're using the plus sign and you know, inheriting roles and things like that, you need to be really careful uh, because ordering matters. And next is the IP address or CIDR notation if you're using TCP IP, um, and then auth methods. Uh, these are the worst, right? I won't go into, the, into them here, but you can choose from uh, trust, password, SSPI, IDENT, peer, LDAP, uh, RADIUS, or PAM. And with each of these authentication methods come a slew of options. And they're fairly well documented online. But a, a general word of wisdom here is whenever you make changes to the pghba.conf, make a backup beforehand, uh, because I've locked myself out of Postgres more times than I can count, and that's not just because I can't count very high. Uh, so. All right, so now that we've seen that, John's going to talk about the CLI. Uh, thanks, Ryan. And uh, to start, I'd like to thank everyone for laughing at the Oracle joke. Uh, <laughs> I was kind of on the fence on whether or not that would work out. Um, so now we've seen the basics of getting a basic Postgres system up and running. Um, you, you see if you can basically just get it up and running, show that it's running and it's listening. Uh, so let's quickly go over some of the common binaries you'll be using when opening a, operating a Postgres instance uh, and comparing them to some of their MySQL equivalents. Uh, the first and the one we've already talked about is the PSQL client. It's an interactive terminal client, just like the MySQL one. Uh, it supports tab completion, as Ryan mentioned. It has a ton of options and is extremely flexible. Uh, and I highly recommend everyone takes a one, uh, at least a once over of the entire manual page to see uh, what you can do. You can customize your prompt. Uh, shall, there's even some advanced uh, command line options as, as well to do can you configure. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I lost it. There's, you can familiar yourself with the multitude of options, and there's even uh, even more improved uh, CLI clients out there that have improved upon PSQL and add things like full inline editing, as well as uh, a bunch of an entire editor inside for managing your queries and executing them in there. Um, the next uh, binary we'll talk about is uh, the PG base backup and PG dump all, and those are used for backups, uh, much like extra backup. PG base backups used to take physical snapshots, primarily used for backups or standby provisioning. Um, it's worth noting that when using PG based backup that it uses a replication connection. So you're going to need to make sure that you have uh, both an available while, while sender and a replication user to connect and use that to stream it down. Um, and then PG dump is for logical backups, much like MySQL dump. Uh, that means you're going to end up with a SQL file or uh, sometimes a CSV, TSV, or other standard format. Uh, it, pretty standard. Uh, these can be useful as a secondary backup format. Like, for example, uh, you may want to take both logical and physical backups just in case a physical backup is corrupted for some reason, or perhaps you need to ship uh, your backups off to auditors uh, every now and then for, to have them audit the SQL. Uh, these things happen. So sometimes you need both. Uh, MySQL import and PG restore both are used to re import dumps of various formats. Very simple. Uh, but they can also do some very cool things like filtering and moving things between tables, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, check out the manual page. Uh, the next one is really important. That's MySQL admin and PG control. Uh, both these are used to do more administrative, administrative functions on the actual running server. So you can start, stop, um, and maybe uh, Postgres PG underscore CTL also supports init DB, uh, as we saw as an example earlier. So that's the equivalent to MySQL install DB. Uh, you'd call that when you're op starting up a fresh instance, you need it to bootstrap itself. Uh, other features from PGCTL include the ability to promote a standby server. Uh, and one last feature worth mentioning is that if you are running on Postgres on Windows, I'm sorry, uh, but if you want to register with your services registry, uh, PGCTL can help you out with that. All right, so we have some binaries. Uh, we have a running Postgres server. Let's quickly take a look at what's under the hood on the file system. Uh, so MySQL, real quick, 
we have a data directory much like PG. Uh, under the data directory, you're going to have your database directories. Uh, and these database directories uh, are named for the database themselves. Uh, to, for example, if you have a database named My App, you're going to have a directory under your data directory called My App. And within there, you're going to have your FRM files to determine your table schemas, but then also your engine specific tables. Uh, MySQL's temp files can go uh, pretty much anywhere into the database subdirectory or even the tempter or even various hard coded uh, strings inside the code base that were never cleaned up. Um, so, yeah, and then Postgres, on the other hand, has a lot of uh, directories to store things. MySQL just likes to throw everything in the top there, pretty much. Uh, you'll see binary logs, relay logs, redo logs, engine specific error, everything is just kind of thrown in the top there with just uh, databases kind of structured into folders inside the MySQL data directory. The PG data directory is really clean in comparison. Uh, we have a couple of files, PG version, postmaster.opt and postmaster.pid with are just general daemon uh, supporting files. Uh, the two direct directories you're really gonna even care about, uh, the first base, which is gonna store a lot of your database and table schemata files, and then uh, PG log, which is gonna store your error log. It's worth noting there's a very important file that can be located in random places on your file system, and that's PG startup.log, which by default ends up in the homder for your initial Postgres user. Uh, that's gonna be distribution specific. I believe in EL it's gonna be verlib pgsql slash pg startup.log. It's worth noting that there's gonna be some useful information there that you may wanna take a look at if you have problems. And under the base directory, uh, you're going to see some numbered directories. Uh, so, so Postgres, you have your data dir, and then you're gonna see like a directory like one, two, three, four, five. Uh, that can be confusing coming from MySQL where you're expecting to see a database name. Uh, in Postgres, what that is is, a, uh, is an OID. So it's the object identifier for that human readable name of the database. Um, so you can resolve these using the PG database tables, which uh, actually carry this, this reference, and so you can resolve that down into its OID, and then you can figure out which, which folder holds your database files. And then inside that, we, you would see table and index files. Uh, Postgres stores its tables and indexes separately. Uh, remember, again, that there are no like multiple storage engines in MySQL, or like MySQL, so it's pretty much the same pretty much everywhere. Uh, they're gonna be named after their file node number, which uh, can be found in the pg underscore class dot uh, rel file node uh, column. Just remember pg underscore class if you wanna resolve a table or index object down to its file. Uh, there are some caveats to that that are listed in the manual. It's worth checking out that there's some ways that those can get disconnected. Uh, temporary files will be prefixed with a T. Uh, each table and index will have a, a free space map and a visibility map, uh, and that's used in general operations. Uh, internally, and it's worth noting that tables and indexes by default are gonna be broken into one gigabyte segments on the file system, so a large table may have lots of files. Uh, the other thing is, the other advantage that Postgres has over MySQL is that it actually makes toast. Uh, so nobody else got that joke. It's okay. Uh, so toast files are also gonna be stored uh, inside your data directory, uh, and it enabled those uh, special out of uh, band page format that allow it to enable a host of features like compression. I think there's some certain special kinds of indexes that can be enabled from Toast as well. It's just a very famous bug in MySQL. Does not make Toast. That's all right, Postgres does. Ha ha. Okay, so you've got a Postgres running instance, you've got a user, you've got an app. Uh, the next big thing is how do you deal with high availability? That's almost, that's pretty much if you Google blog posts on databases, MySQL, Postgres, whatever, generally the vast majority of random stuff on the internet is gonna be about how do I get replication and high availability working and how do I not take down time? Um, and so replication is just one of those standard operational tasks you'll always have to deal with regularly. Um, uh, Postgres replication is significantly different than MySQL. Um, MySQL replication has been around forever. Uh, I, it's very hard to even find a version without MySQL replication, even looking through very, very old commits. Uh, it has been extended by changing the format of the binary log. Uh, remember, remember, MySQL has no knowledge of its transactional storage engines, so it does replication up in the SQL layer and pushes this out to its own format, which is communicated to, uh, which is pulled down from the slaves and then re-executed, very different. It has no knowledge of those transactions. So the formats are RBR, mixed in statement. Uh, and then it is async by default. It offers uh, synchronous and semi-sync options. It's worth noting by default that it has a weakness where if your master crashes, you do have a potential for transaction loss. It's always worth mentioning. Uh, and 
Comparing that to Postgres, uh, Postgres replication is relatively new compared to MySQL, at least Postgres native replication. Uh, before streaming replication, Post Postgres had many third-party uh, solutions uh, due to the extensive interfaces for implementing replication, uh, trigger interfaces, uh, statement-based replication, and then the actual WoW logs themselves. Uh, the most popular third-party one historically, in my opinion, was Sloney. Uh, which saw many innovations and lots of commits and lots of work to improve it. Uh, I vaguely remember using Sloney uh, of probably five or six years ago and just running into a lot of random Perl errors. That was my experience with it. Uh, so I'm very happy that native replication is uh, working and solid and being improved every day and getting better with every release. Uh, and we're going to focus purely on native replication because it's going to be the system going forward that you encounter most in the field as an operational admin. Uh, and it's going to be the thing that most likely becomes the predominant solution for high availability in the future, in my opinion. Um, so it's, it's also asynchronous by default, just like MySQL. So worth noting, same weak point. You have a master crash. There is the possibility for that disconnect between your primary and your standby to where you lost transactions. Uh, it's built on top of the idea of shipping WAL files. Uh, remember, because Postgres has knowledge of its storage engine, it can actually use the transaction logs to replay these transactions on its standby server. Uh, originally, there was log shipping, which was basically the equivalent of just taking a WAL file and moving it over to a server by whatever method necessary, rsync, or you could do a bunch of things and just get them over there and replay them. Um, WAL files are normally 16 megabytes, and um, they were, if you finished each one, it would move it over. 16 megabytes by default is a lot of data that can change in a database, so you do have the potential for a lot more transaction loss. Streaming replication allows a standby server to actually have an active connection to your primary and actually slurp down those WAL files much in much more chunks and much more scenes. So the, the gap to where you can lose data as a master failure is much smaller. Uh, so how do you set up replication? Uh, my, Personal opinion is that this is one of the weaker points in Postgres. Uh, coming from MySQL, I felt like MySQL diagnosing and configuring replication is incredibly straightforward and simple. And I feel like Postgres, there's, first of all, like at least three configuration files, differences between the primary and the standby configuration. Uh, on top of that, you can, it, I feel like visibility into the replication system is still not to the point where it can replace certain certain simple commands in MySQL that just display a top-down view of replication its general health. Uh, there's, there's some work to be done there, in my opinion. But let's go forward and just do a quick overview. Uh, you're going to have to add a replication user to pghba.conf. Ryan mentioned that there are some special keywords in the HBA system in order to add a replication thread. Then you'll actually add a replication role inside Postgres. After that, you'll have to enable WOW archiving or crank up your WOW level. Uh, take a snapshot using PG base backup. Take and have it uh, stream it over and set it up on your standby, and then create your recovery.conf to actually initiate the connection. Uh, the so first thing, let's take a look inside PostgreSQL.com to make sure your primary is actually set up to accept replication connections. The main four uh, configuration options in Postgres that you'll need to care about when setting up replication are WOW, WOW max WOW senders, archive, command, and possibly restore, and WOW keep segments. These are the ones you're generally going to be focused with. Maybe not all of them are mandatory, but you're probably working with these. Um, to enable read-only queries on your standby server, it's worth noting that the WOW level must be set to hot standby or higher. That is very different than coming from MySQL, where as soon as you set up replication, you can pretty much just do whatever you want on your slave, and it doesn't really care, including take writes. Um, so generally, we've seen it set so that it's just always at hot standby because it doesn't have much performance impact. Uh, so it just seems like why well, have to worry about it, setting it later if you don't have to. Uh, max well senders. Remember we said PG pace backups uses a, a well pro, uh, slot, and then uh, each replication connection itself will use a well slot. So max well senders specifies the maximum number of concurrent replication type connections, and that includes standby servers and the PG back backups. So default zero. Uh, I think it's probably worth it just to kind of set it up to n plus 2 or wherever you think your biggest farm size is going to be and just kind of not worry about it again. Uh, the archive command and the restore, it's uh, partner of the restore command are both shell commands. Uh, there's lots of examples of how to set these up inside the manual. Basically what they're used as a way to long-term store well segments past the main buffer size. Uh, while keep segments, which is that buffer size, specifies the minimum number of past log files kept in the PGX log directly, directory. This is important uh, because if it's not high enough, 
your slave will fall off and then you'll have to rebuild it again. And that's no fun to do at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's worth it to just set it arbitrarily high. On most modern systems, there's enough disk storage that you can just crank the number of WAL files up and just forget about it again. Uh, so configuring the pghba.conf, uh, we see much like how Ryan talked about before, first column defines we're using SSL connections over TCP, big fans of encryption, you should be using it too. Uh, replication is in the database column, it's a special keyword that says I'm a replication connection. Our username is REPL, we have a great imagination, and we're also lazy. Uh, the next column is the host it is allowed to connect from, symbol slash 32 from O2, and then we can see we're requiring cert-based authentication. So this is an example of setting up your recovery.com, which will actually happen on your standby server. It's basically the equivalent to your change master 2 on your MySQL server. Uh, it's a little weird having that as a file that you manage and modify uh, and deal with uh, rather than just modifying within SQL. So that was different for me when I was learning that. Uh, main option at the top is standby mode, which basically just says whether or not to start the server as a standby mode. Uh, this actually ties into one of the core differences between Postgres and MySQL replication. MySQL replication really tries its best to just re-execute commands on the slave and doesn't really care whether or not the results are, are the same for the most part. Um, and Postgres, on the other hand, actually basically puts its, its, its standbys into a mode of near permanent crash recovery to replay these WAL files through, much like how InnoDB does on a crash recovery startup. Uh, that honestly enables a whole ton of great advantages where you're, when you're able to actually take advantage of the entire transactional system. Uh, so as long as this is set up and working, the, it will try and catch up all the way, and then once it's done, it will continue fetching new WAL segments um, using your restore command and or by connecting to this primary server as specified uh, in the primary connection. So, uh, we can see here there's a password line. Yet another reason to use cert-based authentication. Putting any types of passwords in plain text files is generally a bad idea, and uh, PKI kind of solves that for us, so I highly recommend that. So now that we have uh, replication set up, we have a working cluster, uh, you're administrating it, everything's working fine, uh, how, do you, how do you investigate that? How do you measure your metrics? How do you diagnose things, inspect things? How do you do that stuff coming from MySQL? Well, in MySQL, you would use the show command. In Postgres, you won't use the show command. Um, many uh, show commands in MySQL are actually replaced by various commands inside the PSQL command line. Uh, so remember, MySQL has no knowledge of schemata, just databases and then tables. So in MySQL, show databases would be replaced by slash list in Postgres. Show, uh, show <laughs> schema would actually be replaced or is backslash ds for Postgres, tables, backslash DT, uh, describe, that's one of the ones that I think a lot of uh, MySQL people stumble around and can't find is how do I replace my show create table. Uh, getting an actual exact replacement for show create table is harder than it sounds, uh, but for now backslash D will do and it should give you most of what you want. Uh, show status is replaced by a multitude of views. It's worth noting that MySQL is actually going this route of actually moving most of these commands into its performance scheme and information schemas. Uh, so Postgres already does that. There's a whole ton of uh, tables that are full of useful information that you should be using to inject into your time series and start monitoring and alerting on. Uh, show variables replaced by PG settings and used is replaced by connect. Uh, both of them have a help command. You might want to type it once or twice. So again, lots of views and functions which describe various aspects of the running Postgres server and its health and current activity and they replace some parts of IS in MySQL and many show commands. The two main tables I definitely have to call out to or views I need to call out to is PG stat activity and PG stat replication. Uh, PG stat activity is gonna replace your show process list uh, and is def going to be where if you need to find your query on what to kill and oh, my query's running too long, let's kill that. PG stat activity will be what you interact with uh, to find that out. PG stat replication is not a replacement for show slave status, but it is a replacement for show slave hosts at least. Uh, and so there is good information about your, your processes connected that are replicating in there. PS settings shows a listing of all options and their current values, as well as uh, some interesting information about uh, descriptions and whether or not they can be enabled dynamically. So we've shown how you can investigate and read these. Uh, so what if you want to change them? That's the next step, right? So in MySQL, there's two primary way, ways to modify the running MySQL instance, uh, using set commands or modifying etc mycnf. And, uh, 
there's, there's really only two ways that can be brought live. Either they are dynamic and can be modified live, or you have to restart the server. Um, there's a lesser known third way of attaching GDB and just modifying it that way. Um, we, I'm pretty sure that would work in Postgres, uh, but I don't really feel confident enough to give it a try right now. So Postgres also supports a set command. Uh, it has a great, great little feature, which uh, you, I didn't realize how, how useful it is until I had it, and that's the default keyword. So you can just go set my variable to default, and then I don't have to look it up in the manual. Isn't that great, right? So um, most of these changes are, are making these changes permanent or persist past reboot. You're most likely going to be looking in PostgreSQL.conf, so that's where you would persist changes, of course. Uh, Postgres has three methods to bring things live, uh, not including GDB. And that is using the set command to modify the variables, using PG control reload, which sends a sig hub to the postmaster, which causes it to reload its configuration files and bring any options it can live. Uh, and the last one is restarting the actual postmaster instance itself, or the entire Postgres server. Uh, so how do you know? Uh, there is a wonderful column inside the PG underscore settings table called context, which lets you know the most minimally impactful methodology to bring a uh, configuration change live. Uh, again, worth mentioning, PGHBA, that file needs a sig hub in order to reload, and so that can be impactless uh, unless you locked yourself out, in which case it will be very impactful. Uh, so vacuuming in Postgres, it's always a fun topic because most MySQL DBAs don't know why they need it and they don't understand what it's doing and uh, they just know it's running and taking up all the IOPS. So a common problem in databases is how to deal with uh, deleted or obsoleted uh, data. Uh, most use pre-allocated structures uh, that make it non-trivial to simply uh, Re reorganize into contiguous pages or data sets and or shrink those pre-allocated table spaces. So vacuuming uh, is basically Postgres's answer to that. Yeah. First of all, to describe the MySQL way to do this is uh, pretty seamless. It's it handled in a background thread in InnoDB called the purge thread. It runs asynchronous to user actions and handles removing data from the B tree. If enough contiguous pages are removed from the B tree, it will handle a compaction, free up the extent, and make that page available for reuse, all without any user action or external command whatsoever. Just always running. Uh, vacuum is much the same way. It reclaims storage uh, in Postgres within the table spaces. In normal operation, anything deleted or obsoleted uh, are marked for, uh, for that, and then they remain present until an actual vacuum is done. That means that if you delete a ton of data from your table, the data is not available for reuse until after a vacuum has, has been done. Uh, it's very important to ch make sure that you do run vacuum regularly, but not as important anymore to worry about it because we have auto vacuum, which we're gonna talk about next. So Postgres Reel has a very uh, highly recommended option. It's enabled by default in some previous version uh, called auto vacuum. And um, so there's two different types of vacuums that you can run. There's the regular vacuum and a vacuum fold. There's also vacuum analyze, which worth looking up as well. Uh, so a regular vacuum handles the main job of the same thing as MySQL purge thread of simply marking, uh, taking mark deleted pages marked for obsolescence or deletion and freeing them up for later reuse. Uh, it only blocks DDL. Uh, it does use IO and CPU, so that's worth being aware of. Uh, vacuum full is vet regular vacuum's older brother or sister, whatever works. And uh, it is handles everything that vacuum does. On top of that, it reorganizes its uh, pages into contiguous length so that the table space can be shrunk by creating a shadow copy of this table and then bringing it live after the fact. So that means a couple of things. One, it's going to block the entire, all operations on the table while it's running. And two, it needs to create a shadow copy of that table, which means you need to have enough space on your file system in order to do this. So if you run your file system up to 90% uh, and then decide that you want to try and reclaim some space, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, the, so going back to auto vacuum, which actually takes care of running vacuum for you. So auto vacuum daemon consists of multiple processes that are launched at start. Uh, there's the launcher and then there's the auto vacuum daemon itself. Uh, it basically looks at a bunch of metrics inside the PG underscore stat tables and other places to uh, look at the health of tables for various percents of like, I've done tons of inserts, I've done tons of updates, I've done tons of deletes of these tables. Maybe we're ready for a vacuum and it will go ahead and try to run a very low, low impact vacuum behind the scenes without you having to trigger it or worry about it. Um, it's worth noting that plenty of times you, I've gotten called, like the Postgres server is mysteriously running slow. We don't know what's going on. We see weird periods of high latency. Go look in your error log. Chances are a vacuum ran. It happens. 
Um, so that's my notes on vacuum, and I'm going to hand it back to Ryan for a quick overview on PLSQL and MySQL's lack of Sprock support. Uh, so wrapping up the talk and sort of stepping away from operational differences, uh, if you're writing stored procedures or porting stored procedures from MySQL to Postgres or from any relational database management system to another, uh, there are a lot of differences, right? Uh, SQL standard adherence aside, the biggest gotcha that I encountered when moving stuff from MySQL to Postgres uh, is the, the way that errors are handled. Uh, Postgres model is really simple, right? You use a raise statement to report messages or raise errors. Uh, you can raise anything from a debug message to an exception, which will uh, typically, but not always, abort the current transaction. Uh, MySQL, on the other hand, uses a more complicated signal, uh, resignal model. And, and signal is the way that you return an error. Possibly you're providing uh, error information to a handler or an outer portion of the application or to the client itself. Um, and instead of explicitly declaring severity levels like Postgres does, whether it's a warning or an error is a function of the SQL state that's declared. Uh, and then resignal is related to signal, uh, but instead of originating a condition like signal does, resignal uh, relays existing condition information, uh, but allows you to modify that uh, information before uh, signaling. So that actually can be pretty powerful in a few cases. I've done a lot of consulting projects moving from uh, one database system to another, and almost all Always, if there are stored procedures involved, that amount of work is underestimated. So if you're actively moving from MySQL to Postgres and you think it's going to take you uh, a month to port all of your stored procedures, it will take you three months to port all of your stored procedures. Um, it's actually much more difficult than, than it sounds. Um, uh, and, and the final slide, I, I did a, a lot of Google searching uh, for this talk to try to find out like sort of what are other people's problems. And I found this, this blog post and I wish I wrote down where I saw it. But like these were the five things that, that this particular person said bit him, which I thought were really amusing because only one of these I care about. Right, so the first one is, is how comments are done. Right, if you can program in more than one programming language, this is not a steep learning curve. Like, it shouldn't take you more than a second. Uh, the second one is actually the most important one, uh, and that is how MySQL uh, quotes differ from Postgres quotes. So MySQL, you can quote a string with either a, a single quote or a double quote, and it doesn't matter. Uh, and you use backticks around database object names. And that's all well and good until you want to start doing some automation in Bash, right? Uh, because then weird things are getting executed. Uh, so that's actually a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, you can configure MySQL to behave uh, rationally and use the single quote versus double quote like uh, Postgres and every other database system. Uh, and then the third one, as last name equals low versus uh, lower last name equals low. And by default, MySQL doesn't use a case sensitive collation, uh, which I guess surprises a, a lot of people. Uh, but you know, it's, it's super easy. So this query from, from in MySQL would return low with a, an uppercase L, a, a lowercase L, or all uppercase or all lowercase, whereas you have to wrap a, uh, the column name and function in Postgres. Uh, next is foo double pipe bar versus foo double pipe bar. Uh, one of these is a, a logical or, and one of, this, one of them is a concatenation operation, right? Uh, this does not bite me because I typically don't ever use double pipe, right? There are more expressive and clean ways to do that uh, in all systems, so I generally avoid them. And then finally, uh, backslash D versus backslash D do very different things in MySQL versus Postgres. Uh, I actually thought that was really amusing. Um, one of the things that we really, really wanted to talk about today um, was explain, right? Explaining queries in MySQL versus explaining queries in Postgres. So we started on that path. And like 40 slides later, we had a 55-minute presentation on explain. So we decided that that's probably a topic left for uh, you know, its own presentation, but uh, there's very significant differences uh, and, and the Postgres version of explain and showing you like what a query is doing and what the execution path is, it's much richer uh, than what's available in, in MySQL. Uh, so it's worth, you know, there are some presentations online that go through it uh, and it's very well documented. So I th definitely think it's worth your time. So thank you very much. Um, we have, a, I don't know what time it is, so we have time for questions and answers. No. Nope. No? Nothing? We did perfect? All right, well, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.